Hey everyone, welcome back to the Student Physical Therapist Roundtable. For September, we are gonna be covering the knee joint. And before we get into the knee, I wanna say that Dr. Chris Fox is on the call with us. He just finished the HIP course for the TSPT modules. We have a uh, anatomy and biomechanics lecture, differential diagnosis. I mean, you recorded like over, over five hours of lecture probably, tons of lecture on this course, a bunch of different um, advice in regards to prognosis, treatment, interventions. So please go check that out because it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I'm pretty so. excited about it. And I know the, the big thing that uh, we talked about trying to make this course about was um, not only trying to treat hip pathology specifically, but how to tie in management of the hip for other disorders as well, such as when you have a patient with low back issues or knee mechanic issues, uh, just because the hip can be such a central point for uh, trying to address some dysfunction throughout the body. Yeah, I notice that all the time when someone who has a low back issue comes in uh, with nerve type symptoms and by working on the hip, it can significantly help like by doing some nerve flossing, some hip mobilizations, mm -hmm. significantly, significantly calm down their, their low back or even knee symptoms, wherever mm -hmm. the pain is manifesting from. But working on the hip is the central aspect to treating everything else around it. Well, and it works vice versa too. I, I kind of, a, a couple of years ago, started playing around with, I found, you know, I do my examination, I find some lumbar dysfunction, some hip dysfunction, maybe some other stuff too. And initially, I would just kind of go ahead and treat everything that I found. But then I sh kind of shifted and started playing around with, well, if I treat one, what happens to the other? And I found that, you know, there's some cases where you can treat either and they'll respond. Or there's some people that, you know, you just need to focus on one and everything else will resolve. Uh, but it, it can be fun kind of messing around with it and seeing, you know, who responds to what and how to be most efficient with it. I could not agree more. And it's kind of, it's always a difficult argument of, uh, do you, what's, what are the primary impairments and how are those going to affect your secondary and tertiary issues? Mm -hmm. So, all right. But September is, is all about the knee. Um, I know on these round tables, we generally discuss what we're each going to talk about. Chris, Chris or Brian, do you want to jump in and, and, Go into what you are going to be talking about with the knee this month. Yeah, um, so I'm going to be focusing more on ACL return to sport, and the reason why I chose this topic is because you know, every single year they have the sports science or the sports conference, and they talk about the latest literature. They talk about all the return to sport testing, and I still get students every single year during their clinicals, as well as you know residents that are emailing me about what are the return to sport criteria, or we talk about that criteria. And I think the most important thing that we see is there's all these hot tests and things like that out there. But what we're not seeing a lot of is some of the anecdotal evidence we see in the clinic or in the athletic training room, which is the reactional type training, the loading before you actually get back into return to sport. Some of these things that aren't that we know are out there, like fatigue testing, but there isn't super good objective data. And I'm going to try to show you guys some of the bridging the gap that we've done in you know, my practices as well as some of the things that we're seeing in literature. That is gonna be invaluable, because that's the stuff that I'm working on with two different people post ACL right now, and the one's trying to get back to, to high school rugby, and I'm using the hop test, and he's, he's over his 90% on, on his ratios left or right, and, but you know, I'm, I'm wondering what other things I can tie in, and I'm, obviously I'm looking at the literature, and, and we're always chatting about stuff, but um, that'll be cool to see that sort of stuff, for sure. Yeah. yeah, especially with, with your background with the, the sports residency, I think that, that you'll bring a different perspective compared to what Jim and I have. I mean, we both did orthopedic residencies, and we try and stay up to date on the research. We even you know talk to you regularly, but with your background, it'll be a, a very um, unique perspective for, for how to manage those transitions. Yeah, I think it's really about, the, you know, the hop test, Jim, for your patient, for example, is a great starting point but it's pre-planned and there's nothing pre-planned in sports. And I think we've all talked about that in the past, especially when we get together for our round tables is if we can work on more reactional type drills and get, you know, that, you know, that really closed um, environment type movements and see how the, the patient or the athlete actually reacts to stuff. It gives us a better idea of their movement and their overall control before going back to sport. Did you see the video I posted um, with the guy who was like going after a stick and it was an Instagram video, my own personal one? Like that, I think that's a, yeah. So, and I, um, but I don't really know how to quantify that otherwise. So it's like I'm using that stuff, but it's like, so it'll be fun to see, to see where you go with it or at least give it 
examples of the different tests you're doing. Mm -hmm. So, and actually that kind of feeds in, I think what I'm going to talk about, and I need to, to hone in on this, but is that message of uh, the importance of knee valgus. That's probably what I'm going to go into right now. So everyone's still, a lot of people are still trying to avoid knee valgus. Um, and Brian, you covered that recently too, didn't you? Yeah, I talked about how I actually train valgus in uh, yes. patients and my athletes because basketball, for example, they're always in the mm -hmm. like on And that's what, completely, I want to I delve maybe into some of like the, what the current research says on knee valgus and then also what I'm doing to, to train people kind of just more dynamically at the knee. So to, what sort of movements I'm doing to get people to, to really view the knee as this uh, maybe a like a 360 degree training the different rotational portions hitting all aspects of the meniscus um that's probably what i'll talk about so chris what about you um uh, I'm, I'm doing a, a post on one of sarman's movement impairment syndromes called a uh, uh, hip extension with knee extent extension syndrome what made me want to tackle this for for this month was i had a couple patients recently that I'd say more traditionally, I would have diagnosed with like a meniscus tear, dysfunction, lesion, whatever, with um, also having a sciatic nerve, adverse nervous tissue tension. And they weren't responding to, to the treatment that way. And I started doing a little more research uh, around this movement impairment syndrome. And I found that, you know, every single thing that they were presenting with matched, you know, what th this was like a textbook case of those uh, movement impairment syndromes. And after implementing it, I've seen some pretty cool results with how they've recovered. So I go into a little detail of how to recognize and, and diagnose um, that specific movement pattern, and then uh, also how to treat it. Very nice. Um, trying to think of anything else that we can get into on the knee today. Uh, do you guys have any favorite? What, and you're just real quick, what are your favorite, favorite muscle, muscle groups of strength and or go-to areas in someone who's having knee, knee pathology? I know I always like to look at, you know, one, do they have uh, full tibial internal rotation mobility? Um, and then also terminal knee extension mobility. As I, I feel like if someone's going to be a fast responder very, and it's true, like knee dysfunction, they'll respond to repeated motion uh, with, with one of those patterns. Um, so I'd say that's the first thing that I look at if I'm looking at like an acute dysfunction outside of the spine, of course. Very cool. Um, Brian, what about you from the sports side? Do you, from either like an assessment standpoint or do you, do you tend to go, is, is quad strengthening the, the most important thing when we're talking about return to sport or is it, are you definitely focused on posterior chain quite a bit? Well, you know, that's interesting. I think that people forget about how important the quad is. Um, I use a lot of blood flow restriction in my clinic as well as just over the last probably four or five years. Um, I went and I got certified in ON science recovery probably four years ago now. And I've been using it since, um, no, I got certified two years ago. We started using it right around that time. Um, I see huge changes with using that and just getting the quad back because the quad indexes now are probably 90 to 95% using blood flow restriction. And that makes a big difference in their long-term gains. You know, don't get me wrong, I'm always working on posterior chain and, and glute activation and things like that. However, I will say, look at the foot too. Look at the foot because I've been working a ton with the foot over the, probably the last year and building from the ground up and it has made a tremendous difference working on really honing in some of those intrinsic muscles. I completely agree. That my, my young guy who the ACL rugby player I was telling you about, if we, we talk a lot about the importance of posture and movement now, and this guy, yes, like no posture really matters, but he, he collapses and pronates so much and he just can't control that, those pronatory forces. So like, if you look at it, it's going into tibial internal rotation and putting, putting them in knee valgus, which is going to stress the ACL. So we've been doing a ton of single leg RDLs where we're focusing on maintaining some arch support and getting in, uh, foot intrinsics going. So I think we're, we're speaking the same language there. And using a cable is, is effective too. I'll throw some of that stuff in there in the post. I think that'll be cool to see. Nice. Definitely. Um, do you guys have anything else this week, this month for the September round table? Uh, I think that's it for me. All right. Well, you will be able to find us all over social media on Instagram, Facebook. Again, Chris's hip course is now available and it's actually on sale for the, we're going to have it on sale for the first two weeks of this month. So if you catch it in the first two weeks, you'll save $5 on the course. 
Um, and otherwise, please subscribe to us on YouTube as well because we're all of our videos that you'll see on our posts, they're going to be featured on our YouTube channel. So we will see you next month. Thanks. Thanks.